If you pay attention to social media or traditional media, it doesn't really matter. Every time you turn around, some lithium-ion battery is catching fire. Might be an EV, might be a scooter, might be a cell phone or laptop. It seems like it's a disaster waiting to happen. Why would you have one of these things in your, in your possession? Whether it's uh, an EV, a laptop, a scooter, or a cell phone. Having a lithium-ion battery is extremely dangerous and could end your life. I'm not that guy. Anyone who pays attention to the show for a little while will realize I am not that guy. A, I don't get super excited about anything because everything is nuance. I know nuance doesn't really sell these days. That clickbait certainly doesn't work. The headline of, hmm, electric vehicles don't really catch fire, but you know, maybe once in a while they do. That's not a headline that sells. But a headline that goes, oh my God, EVs are catching fire, we're all gonna die. That might sell. Those kind of clickbait titles are problematic because a lot of people scroll past them and never actually dig in. So that's why you're gonna see in this particular title, it's a bit more nuanced. I might not get as many clicks. I don't want to feed into the FUD. First off, a little bit of a caveat. I am not an engineer and I am not an expert. I'm a YouTuber that likes to talk about EVs, new technology, electric vehicles, all that kind of thing, right? I do not have a degree in engineering. I'm a facility manager. I know a lot about buildings and things related to buildings, but I am a, an interested observer in the electric vehicle community. So I pay attention to a lot of boring reports. I read a lot of boring studies and I try to distill that knowledge into something for you. But do not take what I say <laughs> as expert opinion and make your decisions based on that. Use it as a, an arrow to point you in the direction of doing your own research. That is all this is, all right? Now, if you hang on to the end, you'll find out exactly how often electric vehicles catch fire and why. So stay tuned. First of the reasons why um, a battery, a, 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 sorry, a lithium ion battery, not just electric vehicles, it could be scooters, laptops, whatever, um, might catch fire is poor charging. I.e. you will charge that battery in a way that is not intended by the manufacturer. Um, think a cell phone and you buy a charger off of the internet from an unknown brand through an unknown source. That device may not be well designed to do that particular job. I'm not saying buying off the internet is a problem. What I'm saying is buying unknown products from unknown sources is a problem especially if they don't have kind of a safety seal attached to it. You'll hear, if you're a long time viewer of the channel, you'll hear I'll constantly refer to things like CSA, Underwriters Laboratory, Under Laboratories Canada, the European and Asian equivalents, okay? These are bodies whose whole purpose is to test things, whatever they, those things are, to make sure that they do the job that they're actually sold to do. Too many of the things we get today are not properly tested. They are not certified. And that can lead to trouble. Do get, do check to see that things are certified. Sometimes things are so new that they cannot be certified, but they are in the certification process. So just be aware. Um, a good example of that is um, adapters between, uh, say, Tesla and CCS, right? Um, a lot of those are not certified yet because the testing body is still in the process of developing the tests to certify it. So they're working with the manufacturers, creating the tests to make sure these things work. Now, you want a manufacturer that is actively engaged with the testing bodies to make sure this product is being produced in a safe manner. Keep that in mind. So anyways, a poor device can overcharge the battery. And if it's putting in too much power, more than that battery can handle, it can create a heating event 
and actually cause the battery to catch fire or explode. So it is really important that you get good devices, reputable devices to charge your batteries, whether it's a little rechargeable AA or your EV. Don't buy things that do not have uh, you know, a backing. A company you can find and potentially sue if it goes wrong. That's kind of what it comes down to. All right. If it's uh, something, something company in some other part of the world that doesn't have uh, any kind of reciprocal legal arrangements with us, it might not be a product you want to buy. Just saying. Poor manufacturing is also a problem. Now, this is a good example of that is, uh, is the Chevy Bolt Hyundai Kona EV fires. A lot was made out of them, like, you know, every one of them is going to catch fire. No. Um, but this was a manufacturing defect, as I understand, and as was reported. Essentially, don't quote me on it 100%, in the manufacturing process, the machines that put these battery cells together inadvertently would fold a cathode or anode or tab or something like that in the manufacturing process every once in a long while. And that folded thing would cause something to happen and would lead to a thermal runaway. It would cause the, the car to catch fire. Uh, that is my understanding. I've never heard an update from that point, so there may be more to the story, so you can dig deeper. But long story short, it was a manufacturing defect, and that's what caused the fire. That is not inherent to lithium-ion technology it is inherent to, oops, we screwed up and made a mistake, right? Um, and uh, both uh, GM and Hyundai made good and replaced the affected batteries. So, you know, that's kind of a win-win. Now, if your car caught fire, that's unfortunate, but uh, it, it is what it is. Uh, what's another issue? This is the biggest one is, as far as it pertains to EVs, and that is damage car is in an accident. That is a catastrophic kinetic event that can cause a, a battery fire. And what that is, is either, you know, the car gets smushed, and in other words, the battery that's in that car gets smushed, or it gets impacted from one side or the other, and it causes, uh, you know, or in that impact, you know, it causes the battery cells to be damaged. Uh, to be maybe crushed or or pierced. Um, if those things happen, uh, that can lead to a thermal runaway event. Uh, and what it is, is that lithium ion cells, as they're constructed now, uh, are either in cylinders or pouches. So cylinders like your average AA battery um, or uh, a pouch, which is what you used to find a lot in cell phones, right? They're still there, you just can't take them out anymore. Um, so that's usually like a square rectangular box that uh, that will be your battery. Um, if that is, that contains inside it a slurry of liquids uh, and, and materials uh, sandwiched between layers of, of other materials. Now, it's designed to be the way it is, and it will work fine if it is not hampered or, or damaged. But if something damages it, either squishes them together or pierces it so that there's a different path for things to follow, that can lead to a thermal runaway. Basically, a chain reaction where the fire starts and then feeds itself. It does not need oxygen. Um, once it runs away, it will just keep burning and burning and burning until the materials are consumed and it is gone. Uh, you can actually see this very well on YouTube. There are thousands of videos of people purposely doing this, mostly firefighters by the, you know, where they'll take, say, a cell phone, put it on, a, on like a, on a box or whatever, an inflammable box, and then they'll take a fire axe, the pointy part, and they'll they'll pierce the phone right to the to the bottom, and then you'll see very quickly the whole thing will go, right. Um, that is intentionally causing a thermal event. Now imagine you're in a car accident and a 
you know, piece of your, of, uh, of your vehicle or another vehicle ends up being driven right through the battery pack. That could cause a thing to go all of a sudden. Very rare to happen. These are within armored shells, but it's more likely that they'll get squished, right? Which can cause a thermal runaway, but it's usually a lot slower. Um, I've, there's many videos you'll see of people intentionally trying to squish, damage, or crush uh, lithium ion cylinder cells, um, and they will sometimes go on fire, sometimes not, sometimes go on fire much later. Um, so it's not the kind of thing, they don't generally explode. They, they will generally start to catch fire, quickly be engulfed in flames, and then whoosh, they're gone. Um, it's kind of like back in the uh, 70s and 80s, you would watch cop shows or whatever, and the car would roll down the cliff. And it's a gas car, of course, we didn't have the electrics then. It would roll down the cliff, and or it would just slide off the road. Didn't matter what happened. If the car was in any way in an accident, within seconds, the whole thing would just explode in a massive explosion. It was a lot of fun. Not particularly realistic. Cars do catch fire and explode if they're gas cars, but not that often, right? The, the last big source of thermal runaway is heat-induced thermal runaway. Basically, the battery gets too hot and it will just catch fire spontaneously and, 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 and burn up. Um, that is more common in older designs that do not have thermal management. So modern EVs have liquid cooling that runs all through them um, and will manage the temperature of the battery. But it also does, so it'll like actively cool the battery. It'll also actively warm the battery in winter conditions. But it, what it also does is it will manage the flow of electricity in and out of the battery based on the temperature of the battery. So if the battery is getting too warm, it will reduce your performance, your, your draw on the battery to keep it cooler, right? If, if your battery is uh, getting too hot, it'll, it'll outright shut you down uh, if it gets too crazy. These are kind of the systems they're putting in place. And you, trust me, you have to really uh, hoon that battery to, to get it to do that. You're talking performance vehicles. Uh, that would do that, not your average everyday EV. That battery management system is much more advanced than it was, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, it is now active. It's got active cooling, active heating, and battery management. So as it detects the battery getting warmer, it will do things to make sure you don't go over a threshold that would lead to a battery fire. Nobody wants a battery fire, least of all the people who make the damn cars. Right, You don't want it, but neither do they. That's kind of bad reputational. Hey, if you think this information has been valuable to you, do me a favor. Tap that like button and help spread the word to the rest of YouTube. Thanks. Some of the history in it. Some of the older EV models, and you'll notice I'm avoiding talking about particular brands because I don't want to get sued, um, but particular old designs that didn't have battery management or very much active heating and cooling. They had, say, air cooling. They also often had inferior battery management systems because, like a lot of things, right, um, we learn from doing. So we've created an electric vehicle. Now it's a performance electric vehicle, an everyday electric vehicle. It's not a golf court cart. It is a real highway-capable vehicle. Some of them are performance vehicles, I'm talking uh, Porsche Taycans and Tesla plaids and Rimax and all that, right? Some of these things are being pushed very hard. You got big pickup trucks now that are, are making big hauling. Um, this is um, stressing everything, stress testing, right? And as the testing happens, they will learn that things can be improved. Um, I think we're past the point now where, where radically unexpected things are going to happen. Uh, we're past that early phase where uh, we're testing and trying new things. Now we're we're in the phase of, of tweaking, right? Engineers, I'm not an engineer, I'm a facility manager. 
buildings, right? I manage buildings, but I deal with engineers all the time. Um, engineers are people that are a really smart, um, but they also have method methodo methodological. No, they're big into methods and processes. So basically, they will create something, then they will analyze how it performed. Did it have problems? What were the problems? How can we fix those problems? Let's put that into the new iteration of that thing, right? Doesn't matter whether it's a toaster or an EV, they will go through the same, pro hey, if it's a manual can opener, an engineer will look at how did that perform? Did it work right? What happened? If after I opened that can 100 times, the 101st time, it became, you know, 8% less easy to open the can because the blade was getting duller or whatever. You know, how can we improve it so that that will start at 200 cans or 500 cans? You know, can we use a different composites on the blade? Can we use a different ratcheting mechanism? Can we gear it differently so it's easier for people with weak hands to turn? You know, these are engineering processes that go throughout the chain, right? And we are now, I think, at a process where they, they're comfortable with EV technology. Um, they know how to make EVs and EV batteries. Now we're in the refining stage, not by no means end stage refining. Like that's where cars are right now. There's not much more they can do to those things to make them better. But EVs are like, they're in their first 10, 15% of knowledge, right? They're, they know what the basic technology is. Now they're improving it. They're making it perform better. They're making it safer. They're making it this and they're making it that, right? All along the chain, they want to make a more foolproof, more capable, more safe product. That is what engineers do. That is their whole focus, right? Um, and that's what's going on now. And we're at that stage where it is a pretty reliable technology. It is a pretty safe technology, but there's a lot of refinement to go. Uh, one of those refinements is a type of battery chemistry and a use case. Now, one of those would be, say, an LFP battery. That's lithium iron phosphate. Um, the F is the iron, it's ferro, right? So um, lithium iron phosphate batteries, the different chemistry than the nickel, manganese, cobalt batteries that are high performance lithium ion batteries that are in sort of the long range, high performance EVs. Um, they are less energy dense. Um, so they take more volume to go the same distance. They create more weight to go the same distance. Um, so typically they don't go as far and they are heavier, um, but they have advantages. It is more stable technology. It's thermal point where it can catch fire is much different. It's much less likely to catch fire in a thermal event. Okay. Um, it will, it's less energy dense. So I think it's about 20% ish less energy dense, uh, for the same weight of, of, of battery and it can be charged to a hundred percent many more times um, than a, a traditional lithium ion battery, but it's less energy dense. It's heavier. So you can go less far, right? So there's trade-offs there. Also lithium iron phosphate batteries do not like to get cold. You know, they can handle it. They can work around it. They can mitigate it. But, um, so in climates that tend to be cold for half the year, like Canada, it's not the best solution. And lithium iron phosphate uh, batteries are a really excellent solution for stationary battery storage. That would be for your house, for your business, for the grid. Um, these batteries are cheaper to produce, more plentiful materials, and they can be cycled basically, I don't know if it's endlessly, but many, many, many more times than uh, than a standard uh, lithium manganese cobalt battery. I tend to ramble a little bit, don't I? Well, let's see how it goes. I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's episode, Allendale Technologies, proud supplier of Siemens EV charging equipment in Canada, both residential and commercial. Siemens, the name you know and trust. You know it's going to work with your building automation system, provide you a great payment gateway system suitable for commercial parking lots, apartment buildings. Siemens, the name you know and trust. Um, before I forget, if you've enjoyed the content I've given you so far, 
I'd appreciate it if you would like and or subscribe. And hey, leave a comment. All those things cost you nothing and help the channel a lot. And I want to hear from you. If you think something I've said is wrong, please tell me. That's uh, like I said, I'm no expert. I'm a YouTuber. Um, I need to, I need feedback. If you know more, if you have examples, uh, please uh, send them to me. I would like to hear it. Uh, also, uh, comment on what kind of things you'd like to see on the show. And actually, this show was spawned by comments, uh, mostly from people who were negative commenters, but also from people who were asking the question honestly, like, what's with the battery fires? Is this a problem that I need to be scared of? Um, that's not fun, okay? When someone asks the comment saying, I hear about these battery fires, is that a problem? I'll give them an honest response. If I get people saying to me that, uh, oh, you know, these things are all going to explode and it's, it's a nightmare and uh, why would you ever own an EV? I might respond, I might not. Um, I find those to be taxing. I try to respond to everybody, but when people are out there just to bash, uh, and they're seeking to bash, and they probably didn't watch the video, then uh, then, then I have little time for you. If you want to watch the video and then disagree with me, I'm okay. But if you do not watch the video, please don't, don't, uh, don't comment if, you, uh, if you're going to be negative. Um, and I know this because, and I don't want to ramble on this too long because I'll lose you. Um, if someone comments negatively, and they say, say basically, this thing is black. But in the video, I explain why black is not black, it is actually white. Um, and then you comment and say, this is what's going to happen. I told you that, and I backed it up. So why are you still saying that? You, you, get, you get the issue that I'm talking about there. It, it's a bit of a, an annoyance. Back to the battery fires and what's going on. Um, EVs, you can be pretty confident in them today. Um, several insurance companies, government regulators, mostly out of Europe on Australia, but also here, um, have done studies. And I know a lot of people uh, find studies boring because, well, they are. I've read them. And if you read the studies, you don't have to read the whole thing, but, you know, at least at least the, the detailed summary, not the, the top line, um, you will figure out, okay, how many EV, how many vehicles were in this in the study? You know, over what period of time? What were the parameters of the study? So, like for example, you don't want a study that was you know out of one hundred cars, you know three were EVs and none caught fire. Well, that's not a very useful study, is it? Because three EVs, <laughs> not likely any of them are going to catch fire. And out of a hundred vehicles, not even any of them will likely catch fire. But the truth is, if you look at, say, okay, we took records from uh, all of Norway, and Norway is a high EV adoption country, and we looked at the number of gas or petrol vehicles, diesel vehicles, and the number, the total number of electric vehicles over the last 15 years or 10 years or whatever is the period. How many of the petrol vehicles caught fire and how many of the electric vehicles caught fire? Now, if they just say, well, you know, uh, 8,000 petrol vehicles caught fire and only 30 EVs caught fire, that doesn't tell us much. It sounds like petrol vehicles catch fire all the time. And EVs barely ever, right? Because you weigh basic numbers, right? But what you need to actually ask is per 100,000 EVs or per 100,000 petrol vehicles, how many caught fire? Right, and the percentage that that creates, and a relationship to this to equal numbers. So, what they found in Norway is EVs are sixty-seven times less likely to catch fire than their petrol equivalents. Some jurisdictions, uh, it's a hundred times less likely. Uh, and so it's somewhere between 67 and 100 times. I don't like the 100 times number because it is too round, right? Um, statistics never work that way. So it's uh, somebody rounded something out. Um, the truth is, though, as time has gone by, 
If the study was a few years old, you will find that the numbers of vehicle fires for EVs was higher. If they go further back, the EV fires is higher. If they do it in a more narrow window, like the last five years, there is less EV fires, right? Uh, per 100,000 EVs. So because the technology is improving, the BMS is improved, the chemistries are improved, um, the materials, the manufacturing processes, they're all improved. That is causing less electric vehicle fire. So you will see over time, less and less and less electric vehicles will catch fire at all compared to their gasoline equivalents, right? Does that make sense to you? I hope it does. You will also see in the media that uh, they, they often will lump, say, EVs in with electric scooters and cell phones. These are not equal things. They are not related to each other very much at all, except for they both contain lithium batteries of some kind. For one, there is no active heating and cooling in anything but an electric vehicle, right? The systems are simply not big enough for that. They are all ambient cooled or air cooled. Um, they're never actively cooled. So that's a big problem. Also, you go, you buy an electric vehicle, you're going to a dealer or a brand and you are buying a car with a warranty that is licensed or, or legal to sell in the jurisdiction you live, right? So it's not like you can go on Amazon and order a highway ele capable electric vehicle that you can put a license plate on, right? It's going to come to your home by going to the dealer first, or in cases like Tesla, they'll deliver it to your driveway, but they do have physical locations, they do have manufacturing plants, they are legislatively covered by, uh, by government. And if something goes really wrong, you can sue them because you can hold on to something, they're tangible. If you buy something off of the web, and it's like a, could be a cell phone, could be a scooter, particularly scooters, right? And, and similar uh, devices. If you don't know where you're buying that device from, you could be buying something that was very poorly manufactured that could catch fire, right? Um, that's the biggest problem. It's usually poorly man manufactured. It's poorly, has a very poor battery management system, and its charging equipment may not be capable, right? It is really important that when you buy those devices, for one, buy it from a dealer, right? Um, and buy it from a brand that has a reliable reputation, has uh, actual offices in your part of the world, whether it's North America, Europe, or Asia, but has offices and you can actually sue them if things go wrong, right? Um, that is really important because if that is the case, if they are regulated, if they are tested, then you will get a device that will likely be safe to operate, correct? Um, like for me, I bought a GoTrax um, uh, scooter uh, to, to run around a stand-up scooter because I know the brand. I know it's a well-made brand. It's a well-reviewed brand. And I know I can get at it if there's a problem. Same with, uh, I bought an electric bicycle. I didn't buy ABC bicycle. I bought the hell did I buy? Huh, I can't remember. I bought one of the main brands in electric bicycles in Canada. I can't remember. And I can't remember for whatever reason. So I'll put it up there. Case the the absolute point here is. You cannot equate an EV to a scooter. These are completely different things. They both have lithium batteries, but the chemistries aren't the same. The manufacturing isn't the same. The battery management system isn't the same. The active cooling and heating isn't the same. The protection isn't the same. How you charge it isn't the same. They're all different. And you can't put one in, and the other together. Uh, and sometimes, yes, things go wrong. Look at look at the, the laptop and cell phone fires that we saw some 10 years ago. That just don't really happen anymore. Why? Because they made changes to make it less likely 
for fires to occur, right? Does that make sense to you? A lot of it is that they're now using LFP chemistries in uh, laptop devices for sure. Uh, and even to some extent, the, the cell phone devices, uh, they're most, the higher, the lower performing ones with the lower battery life are often an LFP chemistry. But with the, the higher performing ones, there are better chemistries uh, that are more expensive, but the batteries are, you know, tiny. So they can spend the money to make them a bit more, uh, more cost effective and, and safe. And their battery management systems are stellar uh, on newer devices, right? So if the performance is causing the battery to heat up, then they are going to reduce the performance to reduce the heating on the battery, right? That's why you can experience some issues sometimes. Um, that's also why if you leave your cell phone in the sun, it does not want to turn on because you've done something dumb with your cell phone, right? It doesn't operate anymore. It'll shut itself down because it shouldn't be left in the sun. The area that we do have to be concerned about with EVs is, and lithium batteries in general, is when they do catch fire, they are incredibly hard to put out, uh, as in, in, in immense amounts of water need to be used to put it out, and then it may not even stay out, right? So you need to be aware that uh, EVs or lithium batteries can be really hard to put out, and they need to develop the technologies to deal with that. Uh, I watched many fire videos uh, from fire departments and, and companies in that space. And they first were exploring more technologies on how to put out the fire. But it's starting to look like that is not at all possible. Like other than submerging the vehicle for an extended period of time in water um, or the battery in water for an extended period of time, it's going to catch fire. OK, uh, that's a problem. Oh, it's going to catch fire. It, it, it could just reignite. So the, the prevailing wisdom is starting to move to the idea of letting it burn itself out. Uh, essentially, you could spend eight to 10 hours dousing a, an electric vehicle with water to put the fire out. And then it could still reignite, but likely will stay out. Um, or if there is nothing around this vehicle, you could let it burn for an hour and it will just become a pile of, of scrap on the road. Um, it's probably more beneficial to let it burn out and just let it go on, done, haul it away, cut the asphalt out, replace the, the asphalt. Bob's your uncle. It's probably more cost effective and better. But in some instances, that vehicle is in a parking garage or something else that you don't want it to stay near. In those cases, you may want to keep dousing it with water to, to basically flood it so you can get it out of there uh, and not damage the, uh, the building any further, like a parking garage. Uh, or uh, what I, I read one article on was Germany's experimenting with a type of trailer with a winch that they can grab onto a burning electric vehicle, haul it into this basically metal box. Uh, close the box uh, and vent with venting going on that will will allow air to pass through, but not the flames. And then drive that uh, that electric vehicle into open territory. Then reopen the box uh, to allow it to burn safely. Right. So these are the kinds of things that we're experimenting on. This is a technology that is in uh, still in in debugging phases. Um, but it is more secure than it has ever been. Uh, the modern, the latest electric vehicles are very rare to catch fire. It's now, I think, mostly down to uh, impact damages uh, rather than, uh, than uh, spontaneous combustion as far as electric vehicles go. And as far as scooters and that go, um, they really need to, A, know where you're getting your equipment from. The charging equipment, the device, everything about it. You want reputable manufacturers. Spend the extra money, get reputable products to use. And governments, for God's sake, stop letting stuff into the countries that are not properly tested and regulated. 
Yes, I'm sorry, everybody. Regulations is a dirty word. But do you want your house to go up into a ball of flame because you bought something off the internet that was not safe to use? You need to be able to trust the products you buy. So uh, they need to be regulated. They need to be tested. And uh, governments got kind of out of that business. They need to get back in the business so that you cannot buy something and use it in, in the country that you live in that hasn't been tested and isn't sure to be safe. If you like the show, be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you in a week.